Good evening. Welcome to the Margaret J. Weber Distinguished Lecture Series sponsored by the Graduate School of Education and Psychology at Pepperdine University. We are delighted that you chose to join us this evening for our 50th anniversary celebration, Women in Leadership, Navigating Power Structures, Personal Challenges, and a Pandemic. I am delighted to have the opportunity to introduce to you Stacy D. Phillips. Stacy will moderate the evening and you are sure to have a wonderful time as I pass you into her hands. You see, she is a woman of power and authority and she knows how to wield it, but for the good of others. Stacy D. Phillips is a partner in the matrimonial and family law practice of Blank Rome LLP in the Los Angeles office. She represents a wide variety of high net worth and celebrity clients as they undergo the significant and often difficult transitions involved in divorce and custody issues. In practice for 36 years, Stacy assisted in the drafting of Senate Bill 924, a bill to extend the limitations period within which victims of domestic violence may sue their abusers in civil court. She also testified in support of the legislation before the Assembly Judiciary Committee as a certified family law expert. It is important to note that the bill is now enacted into law. It is done, it is there, and people who have been abused get the benefit of that bill, which is now a law, thanks to Stacy. Selected multiple times by the Los Angeles Business Journal as one of LA's 500 most influential people, Stacy is most proud of the Adopt a Center program she founded in 1999. You would ask, what is the Adopt a Center program? Well, the program financially supports organizations that provide housing, emergency services, life skills, education for runaway and homeless children, art programs for abused and neglected children, mm, music. Music is something that soothes the soul. Stacy's heart for people is undeniable. Ladies and gentlemen, we are overjoyed to bring to you this evening the one and the only LA's finest, Stacy D. Phillips, my friend and my confidant. Stacy, welcome to GSEP. Thank you, Dean Williams. Yes, the operative phrase is friend and confidant that goes both ways, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> Dean Williams asked me to do something. Absolutely, she is. You all who are participating are so lucky to have you in her life, as I am. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you about my wonderful co-panelists. Let's start with Christine. Christine is a commercial real estate broker who values community, education, and service. What a great triple uh, combo. With 30 years of experience, today she is a senior vice president at Kennedy Wilson. Christine was, and often still is, as other people on this panel, the only female at her level in property negotiations. Beyond breaking gender barriers, Christine's passion for urban redevelopment and community enhancement sets her apart. She founded Bringing Hope to the Family USA, the sister organization of Bringing Hope to the Family Uganda focusing on restoring hope to African communities affected by HIV, AIDS, and poverty. These two nonprofits provide basic needs, education, and clean water 
things we take for granted to our orphans and dis displaced families in the Kenya Hoho, is that the way you pronounce it? Or Jojo? Oh, you'll have to explain that district in Uganda. Next is Kara Katz. Kara is a Stanford engineer and serial entrepreneur. I love that phrase, serial entrepreneur with an IPO and $300 million exit. She's raised more than $85 million in venture capital, generated over 100 million in digital advertising, and she's got two technology patents. Wow. She is currently co-founder and CEO of Riff. Very cool. You gotta pay attention to this. A next generation social platform that combines voice and video chat with music. Think Zoom meets Spotify. Kara is a frequent speaker and advisor with Women's Startup Lab in Silicon Valley, a mentor to Stanford Startex companies, and an active member of Springboard Enterprises. Then my friend, Chicky Leventhal. Starting as a secretary in the 1980s, probably before many of you were born, Chicky Leventhal climbed the ranks in an insurance firm that wrote policies for bail bond businesses. Soon she decided to, to start her own shop for bail bonds. So in 1984, at the young age of 50, Chicky created Chicky's Bail Bonds, a boutique bail bond agency catering to the needs of criminal defense attorneys and their clients. That's what makes her different. Chicky's approach to target attorneys, not clients who needed bail, meaning the clients of the attorneys needed the bail, is unique not only in its concept, but prior to Chicky, bail had been a male-only industry. After building business ties with top defense attorneys, which is how I met her, Chicky's bail bonds clients include celebrities and other high income types. Chicky is regarded as one of the best in the biz and is appreciated for her expertise, compassion, and dedication. Ever mindful that an innocent person should not remain in custody and that the accused, at least in our country, <clears throat> is until declared guilty by the court. Chicky is clearly not your average great grandmother but her experience is a testament to forging her own path, and she has. Next, Dr. Crystal Morris. Dr. Morris is the Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the world's number two brand, Peloton. She's been the first to take on senior, senior leadership roles in diversity for three different organizations, and is typically the only black woman on the leadership team. You see this thread we're talking about? Dr. Morris guides and supports companies in building inclusive environments to increase the impact of engagement and enhance both the employee and candidate experience. She's been listed as one of the top CDI uh, officers by the National Diversity Council and is a well-known speaker on the topic of bias and anti-racism. She is also an alumni of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Education and Psychology. She learned well. And last but certainly not least, Denise Pines, a longtime community health advocate and media pioneer. Denise is a trusted resource for women as they pursue midlife wellness. Not midlife crisis, midlife wellness. She is dedicated to exploring and promoting fresh concepts for menopause, which she believes is the best time of a woman's life. I'll get on that train. She's the founder of Wise Paws, a pro-aging health and education platform and Fem Aging 2020, a report that includes, that introduces a new industry sector, Fem Aging Tech, which includes innovations in diagnostics, devices, pharmaceuticals, and clothing developed specifically for women ages 40 plus, the new young age. Denise uh, co-founded Women in the Room Productions, an award-winning, award that's a tongue twister, filmmaker team producing 11 documentaries. Basically, she has two jobs. She is the immediate past president of the Medical Board of California and serves on the Martin Luther King Community Hospital Foundation Board. I should expand that to three jobs. So let's start talking about what we're supposed to talk about. Let's talk about obtaining stretch opportunities for professional growth and expanding networks and accessing resources. Let me start with Denise. Underrepresented employees, particularly women, can face challenges in the workplace, making it more difficult, as we know, to obtain stretch opportunities for professional growth, to expand networks, and to access resources. How have you, Denise, identified and addressed these challenges? First, um, we need to take the stretch opportunities. We need to have what I call sort of a male attitude of confidence. 
and just raise our hand and say, yes, I can do it. Men will always take new opportunities. They don't suffer from imposter syndrome, sometimes like women do in these situations. And we need mentors um, and or sponsors, and we need to invest in professional coaching for ourselves. Um, but we also need our mentors and sponsors to talk about us in the room when we're not there, because um, that's where the decisions of who's getting promoted and who's going to get on that task force team for that new growth opportunity for the company. And we need them to talk us up. We need to stay connected to our supporters, to those mentors and sponsors with our wins that we have in our current position and include them in our sort of decision making process so that they see our potential and our true capabilities and most important to let them know our willingness our willingness to take on challenges that are outside of our normal job function um, they need to know like how we work you know how we think um, so they feel comfortable in recommending us for the stretch opportunities and thinking about us for those stretch oppor opportunities. And so we can step into those. Um, we need to ask our boss for the opportunity to, for a new challenge um, and to identify strengths that we would use to take on that new project and share with them what kind of skills we believe we would acquire when we take on that new challenge. And we need to create our own stretch opportunities if they're not existing for us. You know, create your own personal project or volunteer at an organization where you can learn a new skill or practice some new skills. And most important, we need to expand our network as uh, ask a colleague to make an introduction and make it easy for them. I'm always asking people to introduce me to other people and I draft the email about, you know, who I am and what it is that I want to share or talk to the person about. Um, it makes the introduction happen quicker. Um, and then once you get that conversation, then you ask that person to do an introduction and you continue this cycle. I use this technique all the time. And I just partnered with uh, Koretsu Forum, which is the largest angel investment organization in the world. And it really began with a mentor bringing me into this member only meeting as his guest. And once I got in, I met the key leaders. And once I met, met the key leaders, I started to say that I have to talk a minimum of three times, right? I have to add some insight and value during the investment pitch rounds, utilizing my medical regulation knowledge, which I knew nobody else in the room was bringing to the table. And then continuously staying in contact and talking about new market opportunities. And then I got the call to collaborate on a project. And now that project will be the first of its kind that I'll be working on with them. And we're hosting it on May 20th. So is it work? Yes, it's work. But ladies, the rewards can be really, really big. Okay, Kara, uh, when De Denise talked about asking your boss, well, hey, babe, you're the boss. But you didn't get there uh, overnight. So I am sure you've had stretch opportunities that you had to stretch to get. So can you tell us some of the experiences that you've had to be able to raise all the funds you've raised and have the business that you have now? Yeah, thank you, Stacy, um, And thank you for sharing your thoughts on that question, Denise. So to put it in perspective, um, women-led startups received just 2. 3% of VC funding in 2020, even though 40% of US businesses are run by women. So talk about a stretch opportunity, throw yourself into that um, and try to navigate it. And actually it's gone down from 2019. 2019 was the peak year for women led startups to receive um, VC funding, and it was only 2.8%, but we're already going in the wrong direction. So, uh, you know, I, I think that that connotes stretch opportunity um, big time. So how I did it was I tapped into networks that support women. And, you know, that was absolutely key for me getting my so-called break. So for example, you know, is the the big bad world of um, being a female entrepreneur 
and you know the the boys club which was getting all the funding and so I turned to an organization called Springboard Enterprises and I was their first cohort and if you haven't heard of them they since then have supported over 800 women led companies 88% of them got funded not 2.3% but 88% of them got funded um, and those companies have created over $27 billion in value. So that's an example of, you know, tap into a network, you know, find these networks. You can just, you know, search, talk to people, talk to me. <laughs> um, the second organization I tapped into um, is called Women's Startup Lab. And Women's Startup Lab is more like a, a true like incubator. Um, that brings together women from all over the world to kind of live with each other for a month and have all of these incredible mentors um, come to this beautiful home in Menlo Park, right? And, and really just live and breathe your business. And so that's a, a different example, but a super powerful example because all of those women now all over the world are part of a network, right? So I'm part of the net network, now I mentor. Um, you know, female entrepreneurs that are just getting their start. And then the third network I tapped into as an example is called Stanford Start X. So it was um, a network of 3000 Stanford, you know, entrepreneurs and engineers, um, lots of tech, but you know, now they can take Pepperdine uh, grads, you know, they've opened it up beyond Stanford. And that's an incredible network, incredibly diverse you know, huge supporters of women. There's even net, women networks within that network. And that has just changed my career. So when I started with Springboard Enterprises, even though so many, um, so few VCs were backing women founded startups, I gave a pitch. Obviously the audience was interested in women led startups. And I got my first funding from a, you know, a $6 billion venture capital firm who that um, VC has since then been on my boards, you know, I'm five companies um, beyond that. And he's on my board today, right? He backed me all the way through my career and it, it was a game changer. So, you know, my message is even if it's hard, 2.3% get funded, you know, I was able to, you know, change that dynamic by tapping into networks, even that thin slice of VCs that were backing women and then I could do my career in entrepreneurial technology companies and do it well. So tap into those networks and don't be afraid of those stats of 2.3%. If I did it, you can do it. So just for those who are not quite as familiar with the lingo, Ed, Kara is from uh, Silicon Valley, which is the venture capital of the world, although here we're developing it in the Southland. Uh, venture capital is companies that provide funding to early stage, not extremely early, but early stage companies. And that's what VC stands for, for those who are not aware of that. Just trying to translate a lingo that you live with uh, every day, Kara. Thank you. Um, okay, Crystal, what is one thing male coworkers, advocates, and managers can do to help address these challenges? And how have you personally used this approach? Help yeah, us out. Yeah, I think you're going to hear a similar theme here. I heard networking, sponsorship, mentorship, and I think I'm going to say some of the similar things here. Um, I first want to start by thanking Dr. Weber for being my dissertation chair, and I want to cons I consider it an honor and privilege to be here and appreciate there being space for our voices today, so thank you. Um, our male colleagues can become allies and sponsors and advocates to amplify the voice of women. So for me, it might look like a male um, leader saying, you know, Crystal is an awesome professional and she needs visibility into this project. So why don't we invite her to the next meeting to be a part of this project team? So I may not be in the room at that moment, but that leader recognizes there's a voice, there's a perspective that's missing and they are, they're, they're advocating for me on my, you know, on my behalf. So that's kind of what allyship looks like. It also might look like introducing um, introducing someone uh, to your network, someone that would benefit from understanding your skill set for a project or understanding your motivations, uh, your career um, mobility um, options, so that they can be thinking of you for the next opportunity. 
And so men who have a wide variety of networks, women don't oftentimes get the chance to do that because of caregiving or just other responsibilities. So males can open up their networks um, and broker introductions as Denise mentioned. Um, I just started my role at, at Peloton. I think I'm about nine weeks in now. And I, I did a, quick, a quickly fair assessment around um, who I thought could play a mentor to me after meeting all the, the executives. And I selected a, a white male that I wanted to serve as my mentor. And I think there's an important piece there is that your mentors don't have to look like you. So for women, we don't always have to select women to be our mentors. And I sent him a note and I said, there are three areas that I would love for you to, to, to mentor me in. And one is access to leaders outside of my own network. So let me tap into your network. I asked for exposure to areas of the business that may not typically um, that may typically be closed off to me, just I may not have access to or insight into. And then I also asked upon developing um, a trusted relationship with me to, I want, that I wanted him to be in my, you know, that close board of network, um, board of supporters um, and to, su to supply me with air cover. Um, and, and, and we like to use the word um, and, and human resources to kind of be in my foxhole. As you know, that term came from the military and you kind of go underneath and come out every now and then and see if it's safe, but someone that can provide that air cover, that can give you feedback, that can let you know how you're showing up, who can speak your name in the room when you're not there, who's truly advocating and sponsoring for you. Um, he was extremely excited about doing that. He also enjoyed our first meeting and, and thought it was a great connection and he was extremely um, responsive and excited about doing that. And I think we have to not be afraid. We have to have both the confidence and the competence to, to address our male colleagues in ways that allows them to know we want to be mentored, we're open to, to learning and growing and that um, they can lean into that a little bit more. Wow, um, I hope all of you listening are really taking this in. I wish I had this advice when I was coming up the ranks. I felt like I sort of clawed my way. Um, Christine, you wanna piggyback on what Crystal said in your experience? Yeah, I think that, um... Especially now, I think it's important to remind your team of who's at the table. And if you're a female at the table, bring awareness to, okay, uh, what are some other women that we can bring into the fold? Who are these other women that can join the team? And I also think that it's important when you do have a female team member is to give them the credit they deserve. It's important to step up for them because they might not uh, be accustomed to that. So um, basically speak on their behalf, give them the credit they deserve, their acknowledgement, their contributions. I know in commercial real estate, you know, there's a lot of people involved. So sometimes a female might not take credit for a very very specific role they've taken in the, in the transaction. So I think it's important to lift other women up, to help them step up, to remind others in that room that this particular person stepped up and created value. Um, the other thing that I do if I'm mentoring a female in commercial real estate is I want them to be ready and fully prepped in a meeting. I want them to bring something to the table because it's important for them to have a voice. It's important for them to step in right away and let people know what their value is. Um, so that's been very important to me. And I've been a mentor to a lot of people in my organization to do so. Um, the organizations uh, that I'm involved with, Commercial Real Estate for Women, you know, it's important to sponsor the, those typical uh, real estate organizations, it's important to be a member. It's important to participate in the events, bring other women along and show them the value of being in the industry. So I think as a, as a woman in commercial real estate, I have a responsibility to do that. So the way I phrase it with people, I mentor a lot of people, mostly women, but many men as well, certainly men on my team. And when they're very appreciative and my response is pay it forward. Whatever I'm doing now, it is your obligation as you come up the ranks to help those women, men and women, men 
uh, to help them come forward. And we're all better together than we are apart. And don't forget that you need the help of everybody who works with you, who's above you, who's to the side of you, and who's quote unquote below you. So mm -hmm. don't step on anybody's head and help people get the best from what they have and to come forward. Mm -hmm. So Kara, you in your man's world, can you share a success and or a setback you experienced in navigating a power dynamic related to gender, race, or political or cu cultural structure of your organization, whether it's a uh, RIF or an organization you were part of before? And what did you learn from this experience? Yeah. Um, never again. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh my. <laughs> Where shall I begin? Um, so, you know, even after having an IPO, I face some incredible challenges in the workplace. And um, I'll share a couple. And, you know, I, I want to say that they made me stronger. I'd do it over again, right? I'd be a little smarter, but um, I, you know, I developed fearlessness, which is really cool. And I didn't have that early in my career. So um, one of the first companies I founded, I'd raised already 40 million in venture capital, had a world-class board. We were a high flyer. I hired a right-hand man, literally a man. Um, I thought he was a great guy, but, you know, frankly, um, you know, it was a power struggle, right? He went behind my back to um, employees. He went behind my back to the board and, you know, he was trying to get me fired. So um, it wasn't fun. Um, it was pretty traumatic to find that out. Um, but what I learned was having a strong board that believed in me and most of my team, you know, really shared my vision and appreciated me as a leader. Um, so I was safe, right? But, um, you know, what I, it's having that strong board, having people that have your back um, and being aware, you know, being self-aware. Um, I kind of thought I was going on, but I wasn't sure. And of course, you know, when he went to the board, they came to me and said, hey, you know, we got to remove this dude, right? So those things can happen. I mean, we, we all have egos, whether we <laughs> acknowledge it or not. And I think being a female in a powerful company um, and in powerful places as all the women on this panel are today, you know, it comes with that, those risks and just be prepared and know you're safe no matter what. Um, it made me be even more conscientious of aligning with people that felt good, like really tapping into my feelings. And that's one of the great things about being female. We feel if we allow ourselves to feel. Um, so, you know, I, I did better um, in future companies, but I had one other instance where, you know, having um, been a successful CEO, I was asked by a VC that I'd be become friends with and I made a lot of money for like, hey, can you go into this company with a 20 something, you know, male founder and CEO and be his right hand woman, right? Um, you've got a lot of experience, you can really shape this company. And so I did and I did an amazing job. I can say, you know, I can brag to you all. It was an amazing job. I brought in the whole management team, got revenue going. I um, re position the company. And I even ended up getting an acquirer where that male founder made $100 million personally, but I still got pushed out. Um, and it was, you know, a power, a power struggle. It was the boys club and I was a threat. And I thought it was, you know, so it was such a traumatic experience um, to have that happen. And, you know, I lost quite a bit of money in the process on top of it, but it really did make me stronger. It made me realize that in that really difficult situation, you know, I got small, I compressed instead of expanded. Um, I got, you know, like I, I wasn't dealing with the situation head on. It was early in my career still. And I learned a big lesson that never happened to me before in that way, right? So, um, you know, I think the, the big thing was I didn't, I, I avoided the situation versus getting the proper mentors to help me navigate it. 
And so I really needed, given how I was feeling, um, that, you know, I, I was getting um, pushed aside um, because, you know, my employees were friends with the CEO before I slipped in as their new manager. You know, I could feel it and I needed to deal with that head on. So my message to you all, you know, in retrospect, being a little wiser, um, and like Stacy said, I wish I had all of this coaching and mentoring, you know, early in um, our careers. But if you get into a situation that doesn't feel right, that it just doesn't feel like you're being supported or the team is operating in a way that makes you feel good, like take a step back, slow down, take a breath, reevaluate. What do you want? What's good for you in this situation? And get some help. I mean, this is an education sci psychology department, right? Get a therapist, get a, you know, a coach, you know, tap into people who are experts in these, you know, dynamics, um, whether it be an emotional dynamic or a real kind of corporate dynamic. But, you know, we're all human beings and there's people who are experts of how to navigate those situations. So, you know, now I have that, that network. Um, so if ever I run into a problem or I'm just not sure, you know, I have people to bounce, bounce ideas off of rather than getting small and kind of like, you know, dealing with it um, kind of from a smaller place, I get bigger and I say, okay, here's what I want and here's why. Um, and it gets better. So take care of yourself and all of those power struggles or anything you run into, you know, pay attention to how you feel. And, you know, there's a lot that just with that as guidance, you'll know what to do. Well, I have a, a, a saying that I really take to heart and I'll share with you all. Good judgment comes from experience, most of it bad. I repeat, <laughs> good judgment comes from experience, most of it bad. Yeah. But you're not gonna make that same mistake again. And if you go through a difficult experience like Kara did, like we all did, and you don't learn from it and improve yourself, it's just a bad experience. Yep. But if you learn from it, you've taken that bad experience and you've made it a positive experience. So don't go in and be small. I'm using the same body language, Carrie, you did. Yeah. Learn from it, put your shoulders back and march and yeah. take it in and learn from it. With that said, Crystal, besides diversity, equity, and inclusion, just being the right thing to do. And if last year didn't teach us that and we're learning that, then I give up. I mean, it, this is the time for DEI and we're big on that in my law firm, hire us to help you with your DEI problems, lawyers and non-lawyers in my firm. So that's our plug. We also know that businesses are more likely to embrace initiatives that bolster the top and bottom lines. And we know that DEI does that. So could you give us one tangible benefit of DEI that you can share? Show us the cost benefit analysis because that's how the people with the sharp pencils think. Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, of course DEI can truly add to the bottom line if you have the appropriate inclusive culture and the welcoming of all dimensions of diversity. And you know, not all companies have that formula. You need both the inclusion, you need the I and you need the D. Um, so where I've seen a lot of tangible results are in the areas of recruitment and around policy enhancement, and of course around product. I'll give an example of just a couple. So in recruitment, in corporate spaces, many organizations are dominated by white male, men in leadership. So if there's a very senior woman interviewing for a role, there's no reason not to have a woman on her interview panel so that she can see herself represented in the organization. That's easy. Um, equally, if there's an employee resource group or network for women, um, tap into them for, for their knowledge around policies. So a prior organization that I was a part of leveraged the insights of women to come up with the right guidelines and programmatic elements to assist women who were ramping back into the workforce by creating, after maternity leave, by creating mentoring circles to help with consistent connection while that woman was out. Those same women also aided in the enhancement of work-life flexibility policies, very important right now, and a parental leave policy. So if we get the right people around the table and ensure all voices are heard and welcome, you would be surprised on the connections and the, and the um, additive to the bottom line. 
Um, in this particular example around um, the women returning to work, there was a reduction by 20% in turnover of women not returning to work because they felt connected to the women who were kind of mentoring, keep, you know, keeping them um, and embracing them in these mentoring circles. Um, so we were sending, you know, pumps to, to their homes. We had monthly calls with them while they were on maternity leave just to check in and let them know what was going on in their business line and their service line. And those connections and their ability to feel like they were still a part of something other than uh, being a mom and being able to have that adult conversation really led to some policy improvement and it led to some reduction in turnover. And so it was really exciting to see um, that. So the bottom line, you're not replacing those folks for not returning because they've decided to return and instead of ramping off, they're ramping back on because they felt the connection to the brand due to that mentoring circle. So that reduction in turnover um, is, a, is a big savings because you're not retraining, hiring, the recruiting cost and all of that. So there, there I mean, that's just a few examples. I've seen some product enhancement um, examples as well. I used to work for um, a cable company in Los Angeles, and we tapped into the Hispanic uh, Latino market to ask, you know, what is your, what do your family members watch on TV? And we held focus groups to understand we were trying to penetrate a certain market um, in a certain Spanish speaking demographic. And we held focus groups for our, to our, with our Spanish speaking individuals. They came up with the new channel lineup for Spanish speakers. And it was called Paquetazo, which means small package in Spanish. And because of their innovation, they worked with the brand and marketing and product team to really help identify the types of channels, the types of programming. And it was all because we got about 20 people together that said, help us, help us really get into this market. So that added um, that added um, some revenue, right? So, so many, many different ways that diversity, equity, and inclusion can add to the bottom line. So let me add a story to that. I, um, for 26 years, I had my own law firm. I had worked for other firms before that. And four and a half years, five years ago, I joined, I moved, moved my firm to Blank Rome, which is a uh, full service law firm. We have over 600 lawyers. And a few months of, into being there, I realized that we had amazing women across the country. I was the most senior woman in the LA office. I wanted to get to know my partners and I wanted us to bring something more to the table because if we don't deliver the revenue to the firm, we're not gonna have the same seat at the table. That's just plain and simple. And I had the idea of having what we call the Women's Leadership Summit. We've had four of them. We have part of the time, a, a day and a night with just our partners, women partners, and then we invite our clients. It has been the largest revenue driven event our firm has ever done. The men at first didn't quite know what we were doing and then they heard more about it and the male leadership came and they're like, whoa, it has driven revenue. It has bonded the women partners. We had an issue a couple of summers ago. There were people around the globe on vacation. We got on a conference call, all these women partners and changed something that was going on because we had that relationship and we have that relationship with our clients and we drove and continue to drive revenue. With all that said, on to Denise. Um, 2020 was a really difficult year, but it had silver linings. And one was a more transparent discussion of the unconscious biases we all have. But discussion doesn't always mean change. Have you seen the needle move in terms of awareness and of reducing unconscious bias? And if, if so, can you tell us a story? I learn by stories, so <laughs> tell a story so people can learn. Yeah, I, th I think I have. I think I have a, a story or two. Um, I agree. Awareness doesn't always mean change. And gender and right, racial biases. You know, let's be honest. It's old news. The, you know, this isn't anything new, right? It's just that, you know, I think the this time the convergence of COVID and George Floyd incident created a focus that in our normal busy lives just wasn't there before. And it engaged more than just black people seeking justice. So we have seen the needle move um, in this respect. Um, conversations are happening in every business sector about diversity and inclusion. Organizations are looking at their employee mix, they're looking at their vendor mix, they're looking at who are their customers and they're looking at it with new lenses um, and that lens around DNI. 
We've even seen some businesses and foundations provide grants to small black businesses and women entrepreneurs in this time frame. Um, there's been lots of promotions to the C-suite and SVP senior roles from the entertainment business all the way into philanthropy. Um, so two quick personal examples. Um, as president of the medical board, I wrote during this time an article um, called Healthcare is Racial Equity, and it went to 141,000 physicians. And that led me to becoming the keynote speaker for what they call the Grand Rounds at Stanford University's Department of Surgery, which is anyone who's kind of in this health space knows like that's a big deal to come to the Grand Rounds um, to talk about health equity. Um, and that would not have happened, that dialogue and conversation would not have happened um, if one, I wasn't led to write an article. And mind you, I had to run that article past the governor's office before it went out. But it led to, at Stanford, more discussion and reflection around patient care. Um, and so, you know, they are continuing, like, you know, are we, you know, providing the best patient care? And what does equity in patient care really look like? Another example, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I have a company called Tea Botanics. We sell um, hot flash tea to support menopausal women. And last year, retailers um, took a look at their vendor roster, right? And realized they had very little product mix that came from black and Latino suppliers, um, especially in the natural foods industry, which is kind of where I operate. And it fast tracked something that had just got started called the Jedi Collaborative which is made up of industry peers and experts framing the business case for embedding justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion into the entire food ecosystem for natural products industry. And as a result, these retailers are now seeking and requesting diverse suppliers who they know will bring product mix that's different. They also know they'll bring new customers. And so DNI makes we always say this, good business sense. When we're inclusive, we get to bring the full spe spectrum of human ingenuity, human perspective, and most importantly, human talent. And this has always, when it is engaged, been proven to be a return on investment and impact. Thank you, wow. Chicky. Other than your life story, well, really this question is, tell us your life story, because I know the answer to this question. What are some strategies used to shine a light on unconscious bias and the need for diversity, equity, and inclusion? How do you turn that teaching moment into change? That's exactly what you did, so share. I'm happy to do just exactly that. This is bias on a very personal level, because when I went into business, I faced bias from three different sources, and the first one was the most surprising. It was 1980, and my husband had just been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I didn't have any idea how long he'd be able to support our family, and that's when I decided that I would go into business. Now, he knew that I was perfectly capable. I mean, he knew of my history. I'd worked from the age of 17 as a secretary in many different industries. And in the 1970s, I was employed by a national surety insurance company, basically the wholesaler for bail bonds. And there I went from secretary to assistant vice president and I ran their bail operation. I supervised all of their bail agents with a staff of eight women. Of course, you know, no self-respecting man would work for a woman, not in those days. So as I sat at my desk every day, I struggled to make a success of my business. And yet every day I could hear my husband's voice booming in the background. Why don't you get a real job? That was the first bias. That was bias at home. It just shows how deep bias can go. The second bias came from a far more likely source. 
I had thumbed through pages and pages of the yellow pages, seeing tons and tons of advertisements, all bail agents, well-established, all male-owned bail agents. Well, is it any wonder that there was bias there? They saw this woman who was going to crash the glass ceiling of the all-male bail industry. They didn't express any outward hostility. They just sat back and waited for me to fail. The third bias was by far the hardest to overcome. I had made the decision that I was not going to compete with all of those male bail agents. I didn't want to open up a little storefront outside of a jail or outside of a courthouse. I just couldn't see myself doing that. I remembered something a good friend had said to me. George Cameron was a very well-respected bail agent. And he said, Chicky, all you need are a few good attorneys. Well, I thought, if that's the case, why not go directly to the source? And so I created Chickie's Bail Bonds, a bail bond agency devoted exclusively to the needs of criminal defense attorneys and their clients. And that's where the bias came in. Why should a respected criminal attorney want to deal with me? He was accustomed to dealing with males, with experience, and here I was, a novice and no experience at all. Actually, ultimately, I think that I won them over with my sincerity. I expressed to them the importance of caring for their clients, that I, as a woman, would be so much more compassionate, so much more understanding of their clients. And that they appreciated. Also, I didn't hesitate to say, as a woman, I would also work harder than a male. And I think they knew that was true. But the clincher was, I told them my watchword. And the watchword was, call Chicky. She comes to you, which meant their high-end clients, their celebrity clients would never ever have to go to a bail agent's office again. I would go wherever was convenient. I would travel to their office, their home. I'd meet them at the local Starbucks, whatever was best for the client. It sold pretty soon my phone was ringing. And eventually it started ringing off the hook. My son left college, my son Mitch, and he joined the family business, or as he liked to put it, I didn't wanna see my mother running the streets at three o'clock in the morning. And then my daughter joined us. And then we had a real family business. And I no longer heard my husband say, why don't you get a real job? God bless. Oh, thank you. Christine, can you piggyback on that with your experience? Yeah. So I know for me, um, I my approach over the last 30 years is to really be an example. So if you want other folks in your industry that you don't see, then I think it's my responsibility to go find those people. So whether it's people coming out of the university level, um, you know, find people that are not in your industry and encourage them to be in the industry and encourage those people also to get into the higher level of our industry, which is the investment side, um, the finance side, um, and encourage them 
that they can they can do exactly anything that they want to do. So my approach is sort of boots on the ground. Uh, instead of looking around and saying, well, uh, am I the only person? My approach has been go find other people and bring them into the fold, encourage them to obtain the skills they need, open the doors for them, show them that they can get into the industry. I got into the industry. Somebody gave me a step up. Um, and the other thing I do too is, um, again, you really need to shine the light on other people that are not in your industry. Bring them to meetings, invite them in to meet other people in your industry um, that can help them as well. So I'm, I, I like to think that I'm the action person. Uh, instead of looking around and saying, wait a minute, there's a problem here. I say, well, if there's a problem here, how can I be the solution? And so over the years, I have been able to mentor several people who became very successful in the commercial real estate, um, real estate industry because I think that I gave them the opportunity and the encouragement to do so. Thank you. Kara, a few minutes ago, you talked about how out of adversity often comes strength and growth. So let's parlay that into, in what areas have you developed and grown stronger since the start of the pandemic, including navigating the responsibilities of work and family? Great, so um, I'm, you know, emerging stronger, um, coming out swinging. <laughs> so, so, in the area of family, I mean, everything went remote. So even that 30 minutes of commute time saved in the morning and evening, like opened up some new opportunities. It's like, okay, I'm not going to just work those extra 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to make sure I meditate every morning and every evening, right? Stay positive, tune into myself. Or, or do a class on personal development. I read this fabulous book called Inner Bonding by Margaret Paul, and I, you know, put that into practice. Um, and, you know, my family grew closer, actually. I have one son who's on his way to college next year, and I'm like, oh my gosh, being an um, entrepreneurial mom, did I miss anything? You know, it's like, he's leaving. Um, so I really, even though he hated being on Zoom, I'm not enjoying his senior year of high school. I really enjoyed it because I got to have lunch with him, right? You know, and, um, you know, cook with them. And, you know, my husband, he and I just did some really cool things. We took Lori Santos class on happiness. She's a, a Yale professor and it's fabulous. If you haven't heard it, it's a, um, you can do it online and you can even do it on a, um, on a podcast. It's incredible. And, you know, we just, we committed to each other that we weren't going to gripe about the pandemic. We were going to always find something to be grateful for. And I actually avoided some friends for a while, um, just because it was just all griping about the pandemic. And so um, we kind of bonded around finding things to be grateful for. And sometimes had to dig deep and call each other out on, you know, complaining and just, you know, really support each other through the process. And then as far as my company, you know, it's like, you know, Zoom is for school and work and my platform happened to be in the right place at the right time because it's like Zoom meets Spotify and it's like for fun and friends versus school and work. So just be like, we're all here listening to great music in the background talking and, you know, adding songs to the room, it's been fun. And the other um, dimensions, you know, music is a hundred billion dollar a year industry, but most artists, except if you're the top few percent, make money off of concerts and merch sold those concerts. So they new ways to connect with fans and generate revenue. So it led to investment, it led to Grammy Award artists hopping on and, you know, it's just been it's been great. So um, my message to everybody here is like, you know, take advantage of a little time here and there, especially if you're going to be in a, a kind of a decentralized team structure where you don't have a community anymore and use that time to grow, pick something, you know, even a little something, 
15 minutes in the morning just to meditate and take a breath. It makes a big difference. So Christine, how has the pandemic personally amplified obstacles or created opportunities that did not previously exist for you? Well, on a personal level, um, I had an opportunity to do a lot more outreach locally, uh, which I love to do. So obviously those organizations needed a lot more help during the pandemic. So personally, uh, I had the opportunity to do that. Um, on the professional side, it gave me an opportunity to tap into clients that I hadn't talked to in a long time, just checking in to see where they might need our services. And that was a great opportunity to uh, show people that we're not going to go anywhere. We're here for you. Um, you know, a lot of tenants could not pay their rent. How is that going to be managed? And that's when I think our clients really needed us to navigate through that because this is their investment and uh, there's some issues with tenants not being open for business. So we had an opportunity to tap into clients that we maybe hadn't done business with in quite some time and to collaborate and create a win-win situation. So I don't know, for me and my team, it was a great year to reconnect and to offer our services and to help people along with a uncharted territory. Thank you. And Chicky, um, how has the pandemic personally amplified obstacles and or created opportunities that did not previously exist for you personally, your business, et cetera? The, the pandemic, I think, has affected all of us uh, personally as well as professionally, at least speaking for myself. I'm deeply saddened you know, to see so many businesses closed, many of them restaurants that will probably never open again. And of course, the bail bond industry has been severely impacted. Jails and courts have had to modify their procedures considerably in order to protect against this deadly virus. They're not looking to spread the virus in overcrowded jails. There was a time in Los Angeles at the height of the pandemic when rioters ran rampant in the streets. They destroyed property indiscriminately, terrified people. Businesses had to erect wooden boards outside of their glass buildings in order to protect their buildings from destruction. At one point, Beverly Hills was targeted. Rodeo Drive, that famous Rodeo Drive with all those beautiful stores, it was completely closed down. Every store was locked and bolted. There was no foot traffic. There was no vehicular traffic. And there was the police standing guard to make sure that there were no trespassers. Now, many of these violators were arrested, but to say that they were taken into custody is a joke. All of them, probably without exception, never saw the inside of a jail. They fell under the sight and release program. They were handed a citation. It had the date when they were supposed to go back to court. There was no bail bond posted. There was no bail agent to see that they would ever go back to court. What makes us think that they would ever go back to court? They just continued to run the streets. Time after time, we would receive phone calls from attorneys asking us to check on a client that had recently been arrested. We would call the jail and the jail would say, no, no, he's not here. Oh, he was bailed out? No, he wasn't bailed out. The site and release program now extended to felonies as well as misdemeanors. Now there are felons running around with no one to make certain that they'll ever make a court appearance. When Chiki's bail bonds posts a bond, it's a promise. 
what we're saying to the court is, this person will be there. They have to show up. If they try to flee, we will hunt them down and make sure they go to court. Because if they don't go to court, where do you think the dollars are going to come from, from for that bond? If it's 10,000 or 100,000 or a million dollars, it comes out of this pocket right here. I'm responsible for every bond that I write. My clients, they all go to court. With the courts closed, there's another issue. Many people who were arrested did not get their day in court. They never got to go before a judge. We had a client who was arrested on a very serious felony charge. His bail was exorbitant. They had just overcharged considerably. He sat in custody for six months, unable to see a judge to try to get his bail reduced to where it should have been in the first place. His family finally in desperation provided enough security that we were able to post his bond. The bail bond industry as a whole has been seriously affected. Chicky's bail bonds has been seriously affected. Arrests are down. The site and release program, that certainly hasn't helped us. But what's really going on here? What about the public? What about public safety? That's my concern. If there are criminals running around with no one to see that they're going to go back to court, what does that do for public safety? I guess we're just gonna to have to wait till the end of the pandemic and hope that things get back to normal. Well, that's a good segue to my next question, Crystal. As we look forward to workplace re-entry, whatever that is going to mean, whenever that is going to happen, hopefully in the not too distant future, how can women position themselves to thrive in the emergency workforce, such as decentralized team organization structures? Thank you for that question. Um, I'm gonna make a, a, a somewhat of a, a bold statement first. Um, there's some research done by the American, the Center for American Progress, and it's calling for the state and federal legislation to protect working parents from discrimination based on their caregiving responsibilities. So first, I hope that that legislation um, might go through. Um, we also need to close the, the male female pay gap and support from others unable to work because of the pandemic and more paid family and medical leave. So once people are back and tied of the organization, we need to encourage companies to review job descriptions and responsibilities for roles that were once entirely site specific or site bound and get those organizations to think about what a hybrid model might look like. So most non-manufacturing jobs can, um, can be done more flexibly um, women can ask for upskilling in new technology, take advantage of tuition reimbursement policies. They can ask to reimagine their roles and what their roles might look like so that they can harmonize more home life, child care, caregiver, spouse, and the myriad of other responsibilities that women have. But to reimagine what a post-COVID, if that exists, uh, world and, and role might look like with their employers. And then companies can also take measures to ensure that women who have left the workforce during the pandemic are offered opportunities to make up for lost time. So whether or not that is an increase in investing in 401k or just other measures, but then how do you make up for that lost time if for some reason your hours were reduced, you were laid off, you were furloughed, because our savings are important. <laughs> so more broadly, business leaders should reassess workplace norms um, to increase work-life flexibility for, for all employees. Um, there was a study that I read just two days ago and there's a lot of research coming out, McKinsey and Oxford studies, leanin.org. I think I've just read at least five studies on this topic in the last couple of weeks. And one of them estimated that employment for women may not recover to pre-pandemic levels until 2024, two full years after recovery for men. 
And so some companies are looking into returnships, which are programs specifically designed to target women and ensure there are spaces for them to thrive in the workplace. Everything from upskilling to the flexibility to um, gaining new skills, enhancing their tuition reimbursement policies. And some companies are very intentionally focused on doing this. I think women need to come back into the workforce uh, hungry for more, but also uh, confident and bold enough to ask their, ask their employers for exactly what they need. There's no better time than to speak up and use your voice to ask your employer for exactly what you need. If it's, I'm only gonna come in once a week for the next six months, or my child now has an 80% work schedule, I mean, 80% hybrid schedule with school, so I need to be home more. So maybe I'll reduce my workout, you know, maybe I'll come back at 80%. And then I'll move up and quick, you know, slowly transition to 100%. But there's no better time than to ask for what you need, to state your motivations, to think about what career progression looks like, and to think about what mobility and flexibility look like for your workspaces. So my law firm just had a town meeting today, and our managing partner shared a survey we did in the firm about returning to work. And we had uh, votes and comments at, God, please let us go back. We're missing the interpersonal relations to others saying, I never want to have to work in the office again. I am so much more productive. If you want me to come in a few times a month, I've, I've saved so much time. I'm more productive. I'm generating more. And then how to meld all that and honor the different ways people work in different environments after we've invested in all this real estate for our 15 offices. Um, it's gonna be interesting. Our firm also has a program uh, way pre-pandemic for women who have been out of the workforce, lawyers who have been out of the workforce because they raise families and then re-entry. And it's gonna be interesting to see what we do as a firm uh, for others out there who've been furloughed, et cetera. Uh, and each company has an opportunity to look at it anew. We're not gonna have the old normal, we're gonna have a new normal and like it, let's make it a better normal. With that in mind, Kara, um, can you piggyback uh, on what Crystal said? You're a lot of down, so I'll throw out one. Um, Interesting. From Silicon Valley, yeah, he's had the worst technical problems of all of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's bizarre. Live in the hills. Um, okay, so away from all of that. So. Um, the key thing I want to add is that, you know, everything in tech is being decentralized. So women, um, let's take advantage of that. That means you can apply for those stretch opportunities that are maybe outside of the you live in, like apply, apply everywhere, outside of your geography, outside of, you know, your comfort zone. Like it was we lose her. Okay, I'll pivot to you, Denise. Can the evolving post-pandemic workplace help women and other underrepresented groups obtain stretch opportunities for professional growth and advanced self-care needs? That's a big question. Uh, for many people, um, I mean, we are really yet to know what post-pandemic workplace looks like, right? Um, you just talked about your 25 offices and the fact that a lot of people aren't in those offices and do we really need those offices? So for some, it's gonna be you know, fully returning back to the office. Others, it's gonna be a hybrid and then others are gonna be permanently working from home. So the scenarios will be different for, for each. And we are social beings. You know, we do like working with our colleagues and be, you know, being in physical meetings are, are important. You know, it's sort of just even the after talk that you tend to have after you know you're walking out of a meeting, um, those things don't really happen over uh, Zoom. You know, when Zoom ends, it's over, and you know maybe you've got a follow-up call, but not where there's a collective group of people who can kind of come together and and, and sort of chat. Um, but one of the things that um, uh, you know this sort of working virtually has done for people of color, they believe that. Um, and there's been some articles written about this um, in the New York Times is one that I read that 
they believe they are not getting new work assignments and they're not getting advancements um, because they are um, not visibly present. They're not, you know, seen in their workplace. And if they're only, you know, if they're only one or two um, in the managerial environment and they're visibly not seen or for some reason not put on, you know, particular calls, um, they're finding that they are losing ground in this COVID era. So, um, you know, so as the workplace changes, you know, this hybrid, you know, home, however we're looking at it, it has to really look at um, how is inclusion going to happen in that environment? How are people really going to be promoted um, if I choose to go hybrid or if I choose to permanently, you know, work from home? How do we, in, how does, you know, inclusion work there? Um, and so those are, you know, new conversations that have to be had. So on the sort of self-care, I mean, I always say self-care is self-love and we're rarely taught strategies for feeling good, right? Like when, when are you taught strategies for feeling good? And I know we have our vacations and our nail appointment each week or hair salon and maybe the monthly massage, but there are other approaches that we need to start to look at um, that we can do throughout our day right? Women um, during this time have really become stressed. And for me, you know, I'm looking at what are the health outcomes that we're going to see um, that's impacted um, society in the next two to five years based on the stress that people had from whether it was just simply working from home and they feel like they're social people and should be at work or whether or not it was I had to work and, you know, teach my child or I'm one of the people who lost um, my job. But there are things that we can do like breath, you know, technique work or energy work that we can do. And nobody has to even know that we're doing these things um, that can rejuvenate us, especially if it, we've had a bad conversation with a coworker. Um, and then just how do we unwind at the end of the full day? A lot of times we don't unwind in ways that actually release that stress and energy. We might go, I'm gonna grab my red wine and watch maybe my favorite show, but that actually does not de-stress you. Um, in some cases, it can actually um, exasperate um, the, the stress that you've put your body through. Um, so I just think that um, as women, that we need to look at other ways to, you know, work within our day and take care of ourselves. So my dear friend and next door neighbor coined a phrase, another phrase I like to repeat, which is there's nothing bad about feeling good. Think about that. Um, with that in mind, my law firm started a wellness well-being uh, committee. They had their first event yesterday, which I was too busy working to attend and which is not a good fact. Uh, the chair of the firm told me it was great and I'm gonna make it my business to go to these things because you're right. We need to take care of ourselves. And speaking, speaking of taking care, now that you're back, Kara, do you want to finish your thought before we talk about pearls of wisdom? Yeah, my it, it's just that I think that um, environment, we can view it as a negative. We can define the pearls. In it. And I think for all of us here, it's opening up new career opportunities if you're looking and um, it's opening up opportunities for me to hire outside of Silicon Valley and get some talent that I could have never gotten before because the whole dynamics changed. So just you know, think about those stretch opportunities and go for it outside of your area if they don't exist in your neighborhood and enjoy maybe the opportunity to work at home and you know not have a commute and have that extra time at the end of your day, like Denise said, where we unwind and you know, we just saved some time. So I, I view it as an opportunity if we look at it that way. So for me, I found that, um, I don't know if I found time because there are no boundaries anymore. Uh, a Monday, a Sunday, a yeah. Saturday, uh, six in the morning, 11 at night, clients have no boundaries and we have no boundaries. And so yeah. that has to change. Um, with that segue, I'm gonna go through each one of you and ask for one brief pearl of wisdom or tool from your toolbox. You can tell me which of those phrases you like. 
And let's start with Chicky. Senior first. My pearl of wisdom is this. I was 50 years old when I created Chicky's Bail Bonds in 1984. It is never too late to change your career path, to follow your dream, do what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. Well, you have a philosophy like my last daddy said, it's not work if you love it. Yeah. Denise, a pearl or a tool, your choice. Um, well, I, I like to stay on the health path. And I think that every woman, definitely once you at least turn, get into your 20s, should have a hormone test. Um, it's very valuable. So for younger women, it's about if you want to have a family to be able to monitor um, whether or not you can have that family um, at that you have to have it younger or you can have it older. And a lot of times we make an assumption, young women today, that they can, you know, you know, bust out a baby at 40, 42 to 45. And that's really not, that's really not true. Um, you've got to have a really healthy body to be able to do that. And you've got to have a lot of support health. Um, and also to do it for women who are getting older, if you find that I'm lacking energy, like I have all this motivation and all this, you know, intellect and skill set to do something, but I'm finding I'm forgetful. I'm finding my energy is lacking. I'm finding that my moods are swinging, you know, knowing what's going on and then being able to get that solved with um, a healthcare practitioner is really important. And I find that women, as they get older, don't take care of themselves in this way. I remember you told us when we were talking amongst ourselves before today that truly, truly choices you make when you're young, really, truly, if I say that one more time, impact who we are, how we are when we are older. So start young, all of you out there. Um, Crystal, pearl, a tool. I think that my tool, I love tools and toolkits. So um, I'm just, you know, words of wisdom that I typically pass on to others. I'm just going to share that. True inclusion requires that you truly see a person and everything about them, including their identity. So saying, I don't see color is not a very inclusive statement. So you should also know that you, you should also see that you respect them enough to make room for all the good they have to give. So be okay in your environment with disrupting the power dynamic and systems that have oppressed women and other marginalized people. Be okay and give yourself permission to disrupt those power dynamics. Thanks. Okay, so Christine, I think you were the one who came up with the tool. Yeah, so um, part of my toolbox has always been Surround yourself with people in your industry who have the utmost integrity. You know, um, integrity is everything in anyone's business. And also find yourself a great mentor or mentors. Because once you have a mentor, that person can walk alongside of you and help you develop your skills. So uh, surround yourself with people who have a lot of integrity, hold them close. And at the same time, find yourself a great mentor and mentors all throughout your career. And you'll find that um, you're going to be heard and hopefully they'll walk alongside of you to achieve success. I think we lost Stacy, So I'm going to hand it over to Dean Williams to close us out for the evening. This has been phenomenal. Phenomenal indeed. I am hoping that Stacy finds her way back because I'd love to hear her final comments. I'd love to hear the um, tool in her toolkit. But I do know for Stacy, networking is huge, is huge. Um, I have had the pleasure of being at her home when she throws these magnificent parties, specifically inviting particular individuals and connecting them with different people, sitting them beside each other and coming around and saying, you do this and you do that, you need to get together. She is purposeful, purposeful about people getting together 
and doing great things, particularly things that benefit others. Um, this panel has really, really inspired me. I've taken so many notes. If I try to read them back, we will be here another hour and a half. Mm -hmm. But I, I do want to thank our guests for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and be with us and share your pearls of wisdom. This has been a phenomenal venture capitalism, bail bonds, woman and what that means to our society. Technology, oh my goodness, HR, Peloton. One day I'm going to get a Peloton bike and I'll think of you all the time. I cannot thank you enough. Everyone, I, I have been getting, as you probably can tell, my phone has just been blowing up. <laughs> And it lights up every time a message comes through. Nine times out of 10, those messages have been about this panel, how you have stirred the in energy and the inner being in each and every person listening. Um, I, I can't thank you enough. We will remember to take the stretch opportunities we will remember to make the stretch opportunities. We will remember that as we seek to reopen our society and figure out this post-pandemic lifestyle, that we women, we have the power to speak into what that will look like. We have the power, we have the voices to stand and say, this is what we need and to reshape our society in a very significant way. I hope and pray that we will recognize our, our power and that we will be mindful that it is a good and pleasant thing when we do. We must come back hungry. Ooh, that one hit me hard. We must come back hungry for more and be bold and be bold. Mm. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Stacy. She says she clicked on the questions and it clicked her out. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you each and every one of you. It has been a blast. I think our former Dean Margaret J. Weber would be overjoyed with what, she, what we have experienced tonight. You have helped to keep her legacy alive. You have helped to inspire the next generation. We wish each and every one of you God's greatest blessings. May he bless your going out and your coming in. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, productivity, and power. But most of all, may he shower you with love as you have showered us tonight with your love. Thank you, audience, for coming. God bless each and every one of you. Vanessa and crew, can we all just give Vanessa and her team a round of applause? Can we just Absolutely. Absolutely. applaud her? <laughs> well, well, Stacy, I gave a, a benediction of sorts. I could hear. But, I could see. Uh, no, but I want you to have the last word. Would you please get, take the last word and send us home? Uh, I was actually going to have you do that, but you already did it. Um, learn your <laughs> technology so you don't get into a fix like this. It's be part of the fun. Yourself, be kind to your family. Be kind to your coworkers. Um, and God will be kind to you. Thank Amen. you all. This has been a wonderful opportunity. I wish I had these opportunities when I was coming up the ranks. And those of you in the audience, don't take this for granted. You have just been mm. given 
some remarkable women. So God bless, Godspeed.